Hey guys, it's Matt. Chapter 26 of the still unnamed reality book is very long, so I'll get to it right away. But I always check the news before these presentations, just in case anything big happened in the world overnight. And there was incredible good news that warmed my heart, and I'll share it with you now. Our legitimate president, Joe Biden, is going to visit Israel. He's going over to give a stupefied, incoherent speech. Yeah, that'll help. <laughs> that'll get it done, Joe. Maybe he'll decide to stay over there, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I can't wait for the speech. Chapter 26. The dark reality plays a variety of tricks on real people, so they do for it what it cannot do on its own. One of the main outcomes of a successful trick is to get people to tune to its radio station or frequency where the main reality broadcast is coming from. But no, I don't think there's actually a giant radio tower. I don't think it's literal, but we don't know for sure how this works, but we know it's there. It's the only way I can talk about it. And there seems to be different types of frequencies, one for real people, one for maybe NPCs. There could be another dark frequency for the creeps who spend their entire lives serving its dark agenda, implementing everything the Not Milk once implemented. People like Snoop Dogg is on its dark frequency. Chuck Schumer is on its frequency. Tony Blair is on its radio station. Maybe the guy working down at the DMV Drivers Center may be on a certain frequency. The assistant ski instructor in Canada is certainly on the dark frequency. It seems that hundreds of millions willingly serve what I call not milk and listen to that, quote, radio station, many of which, maybe not the assistant ski instructor, but most of which who get the frequency don't know they're even tuned in or what they are serving. For many years now, I've proclaimed they're on some sort of download, and I was declared a loon by many people for doing that. But we don't know the exact process just a simple way of describing maybe a technology, a spell, something that we don't understand and probably never will, but that's okay. The person who runs the Pennsylvania DMV Drivers Center is not evil. He's simply or she's simply serving the screen in a specific way that propagates the Not Nilk's master agenda. Government red tape and waste could have gone away a long time ago. The dark reality works to create more of it each decade, and people follow along on the frequency that it wants to comply. There's no good reason to go stand in line every few years to get your driver's license renewed. I doubt if you randomly interviewed the people that work at the DMV that they would even know how to answer the question, look around, sir, what is all this for? I think most of the employees would say, uh, heck, I never really thought about why we have to do this. <laughs> Thousands of things are placed into the reality to distract and irritate real people. And this distraction is actually the reason much of the code, regulation, ordinance, and statute exists. But let me be very clear for the first grade truther. The people that put in all this code and law and regulation, they're not then going off to meetings at the Legion of Doom, just happy with themselves that they're screwing people. They know not what they do. They absolutely propagate what this thing in the shadows not milk once while being on the frequency and actually believing they're trying to help. The not milk is a master at creating red tape and busyness and bullshit things we have to do and tying us up and distracting. And you ever hear this one before? We are experiencing longer than expected wait times. So listen to this horrible hold music for a few minutes, you poor devils. I've never heard that one. I'd like to. In terms of the distraction game it plays, it's a master of incrementalism. It's satisfied with tiny steps forward because it weighs its results across the masses as a collective. To your best friend, spending an additional minute on hold is no big deal. And if they were listening to what I'm saying now, they would think me a loon. They would say, an extra minute on hold, that's no big deal. This lunatic you're listening to is talking about some bizarro thing called not milk and distraction tactics. What the hell are you people listening to? Well, some people can see it, some people can't. The not milk does not see a single minute of wasted time. It sees 400 million minutes of wasted time. Because yesterday, as it looks back at its results, 400 million people had to spend an extra minute. What it does is only viewed in terms of the collective. Those that are micro-irritated to one extra minute don't notice anything because it's only one minute and it's only happening to them. And one more time, the people at the company, 
where you're on hold with their customer service at their company, they're not plotting and planning in dark robes to try to screw you. They're somehow on a frequency. We know this because nothing is ever fixed. The irritations in society get worse. The red tape, the distraction, it rolls down a hill like a giant snowball. You never ever get any good news. It piles on. It must be a frequency. And if you're relatively new and all of this sounds very strange to you, well, it is very strange. It should sound strange. But once again, we can take much good news away from it because once again, reality gives itself away. A world where the pendulum only swings in one direction is not a real world. For example, have you ever heard an announcement from any level of government or its agencies like this one? We at the DMV would like to announce because of what we just did, your dealings with us just got 80% easier and will continue to make your life easy the next time you visit us. You ever hear that? You never will. It gives reality away. It always works in the other direction. The last time I was at the DMV, they were pushing me into yet another form of ID that someday, if it ever goes in, I'll need to fly on an airplane in the United States, something called real ID that they keep pushing back. Instead of streamlining, it has created another layer of bureaucracy. In the week Real ID is finally implemented in the United States and it's no longer pushed back, imagine the thousands or tens of thousands of people who will be sent home from the airport because they didn't do it right, they didn't know. And the person will step up, some representative of Not Nook on the download will say, sure, you've used this driver's license here to fly in this country your entire life. But we see now that your driver's license is not stamped with the golden dildo making it real ID. You needed to reapply for something different, you poor devils. You just lost your $500 ticket price because you missed your flight. So go home, you poor devil, and make sure you follow our rules next time. How dare you believe you can fly with the same old ID that you've been using for 40 years? What did you expect? Our systems to be logical and to make sense? Now go home, sir. Regarding real ID and everything else like it that it imposes, the normies around us, of course, will be the palace guard and make continual excuses for it. Like, Matt, you know how governments are. They'll never be efficient. It's okay. Just the way things are in a modern life. What are you talking about? A download or a frequency? Are you some sort of loon? Others will actually believe in the teismismism angle and think that real ID is some security measure needed to save lives or something. A Ken doll in a backpack could save more lives than real ID. Sorry, when the pendulum moves in one direction only for a hundred years, it reveals there's a lot of creepy shit going on in a fake world. In a way, your friends and family are a minion of a different sort because they always support its silent broadcast. When the not milk says, I approve this message, your cousins jump out of their chairs and say back to the television, yeah, I do too. Your family are satisfied Jones Plantation voters. Most people here with us are staunch defenders of reality. In them, the master blaster of body and ego has already won. The spiritual arm of the Vitruvian man has been torn off a long time ago. Almost everyone around us appears to be on some sort of download, and what we once pondered is now very literal. I learned a long time ago that the mystical, occult, magical nature of this strange place is something we'll never understand while alive in the body. But it wants us trying to figure a lot of it out with endless conspiracy research. The banning of certain topics on various platforms is not done because they fear the truth will spread. It actually makes the bog research activities more desirable to many and implies the research is, in fact, legitimate if you just spend enough time and do the hard work. Matt! We're censored as a collective because we researchers are getting very close to the truth. No. Go back to your spitballs, first grade truthers. If you seek to take your energy out to the screen and focus on the outer ring with your research, it will thank you for that, and then it will start sucking your energy. It's finally time to abandon the normal reality bookends and simply declare that the world isn't very real, so you can get on with what you need to do here for yourself. If you choose to do that, you don't need to understand the specifics of what exactly the not milk is up to. You simply have to realize its main goal, which we already know. Yes, as of right now, we know enough. We've learned more than we could have possibly imagined we could have learned 10 years ago. One more second of researching it is the bog. It's benefiting it if we do that, not you. 
Why not exit the bog for good and begin to do the work that it does not want you to do, I assure you. If you decide to do this, probably lights and alarms go off in its Chernobyl Aluminum Ducati Control Center, and then the parallel one that runs at Three Mile Island, like, beep, beep. What's happening over there on your control screen? Report, mister. Uh, sir, there's a bunch of people exiting our bog. What? That can't be right. Let me see that. They're, look, they're exiting. They're not going to do any more research. We'll give them mud flood. We gave them that. Sir, give them Tartaria. We gave them that. We just did Israel-Palestine. Oh, shit. We got nothing else to give them, and they're still exiting. What do we do? In terms of what's going on in this reality system, some people think it's a fair game being played here between a spiritual being like yourself and creepy role players that are inserted into this reality to be your adversary. In this scenario, there are many lessons to learn, but few consequences. Others believe we're in a battle of tremendous consequence in order to avoid spiritual oblivion of sorts. Either way, I point out to you again, who cares which one of these is right? The beauty of the final truth to me is our path is exactly the same no matter what the stakes are at this point. What to do every day if you've come this far is not based on stakes, is it? Our choices are the same no matter if there's a spiritual consequence or not. I don't do what I do in life at this point for a reward or to avoid a punishment, so it doesn't matter. Me, say five years out of college, would not recognize the me of today. And that's a very good thing. I'm alien to that person 20 to 25 years ago. Someone who once tossed a nest of blue robin's eggs into the woods because the nest was built into his door. I didn't lose no sleep over it. Didn't think twice about it. Justified it somehow. The dumb bastard's dumb enough to build a nest in my door. It's survival of the fittest. Darwin gives me a right to toss his ass into the woods. Darwin, right? I'm just helping the species get better. The next one might not put it in the damn door. See, I, I justified it even if I... I don't even think I had to justify it. I don't think I really gave a shit at all. You know, which is good because I see how far I've come. I've actually put outside 10 mosquitoes this summer. In my house, put them outside. Collect them up in little cups. And these little bastards are attack first, ask questions later, bloodsuckers. Although knowing their true nature did allow me to rationalize the killing of several this summer in the middle of the night, say. I ain't getting up at no two in the morning and put out and out something outside that's trying to suck my blood. I didn't love doing it, but I did it. For all other insects, though, I'm powerless to do anything to harm them. If a spider wants to be on my bed, I must move over for it. I'm not joking. Spiders don't. I love spiders. Put them all over me. I love a spider walking around on my hand. Unless it's just one of these massive ones that I see the last few weeks with a giant yellow sack. That I will not put in my hand. But you know what I mean. Anyway, what a tree-hugging, goody-goody asshole I've become. However, there's a part of me that's very proud of me, if that makes any sense. I see how far I've come. I'm patting myself on the back right now. Hey, <laughs> Matt, you did that. You're not going to do that in every damn <laughs> video. No. no, that'll be the last time for a few weeks. I've told you a few times about how I lived in the house here with the cat Boots, peeing on trash bags for years, laid all over my floors. And when I was lucky, she used the bag. <laughs> I estimated this by hand piss cleanup happened over 2,000 times. My house stunk of pee. My family thought I was nuts to live like that. I didn't care about the house at the time or what anybody thought. She's gone now. I saw my responsibilities through to the end. I was very proud of what I had evolved into in order to be able to do that. These are not cats I've had my entire life. They were dumped on us because Pam decided to rescue them from a nursing home because of COVID. I'm not looking for the humanitarian award. Again, the point here is the person I am today would not be recognized by me at 25 years old, by 30, 35 years old. There's, if you showed that person a crystal ball, look what y'all ass is, <laughs> is doing in 2020, 2020. I went, there's no way. First, I would say as my 25-year-old self or 30-year-old, first off, I'm allergic to cats, highly allergic. Constrictive air tubes, wheezing, almost need like that primatine misc shit. I was like, there's, that's not possible. That could not be me. And even if I wasn't allergic, I wouldn't have these cats. And look what the look what that one's doing. Long hair is doing to my house. There's no way in the world I would think that's possible. And I mean impossible. This is the person that just tossed the damn robin's eggs, the little blue eggs, out into the woods. Okay, we've all made these sorts of strides or you wouldn't be at this channel. I can only give you my personal experience. I don't know what you've been through. But most of us have changed dramatically 
That's how we know we're winning. There's a big segment of the truth community. Oh, it's not fair. Woe is me. We come in blind, mind wipe. There's no way this could be a school. There's no way this could be a test. We come in knowing nothing. If all this is stacked against us, then how are we winning? How have we been able to figure out all that we've been able to figure out, see through absolutely everything. Spiritual messages come in all forms of art, right down to the complete childish, the cartoons or nursery rhymes. How is it that it's working so hard if we have no chance to win? You see how these arguments from certain segments of the truth community make no sense. If it's so stacked against us and we have no chance, what's it working so hard for? This is common sense. And one note before the next section, going back a minute, um, people will be confused by this. I'm confused myself. I said I was allergic and I would wheeze up. I've been around cats at old girlfriend's house where I was like, (gasps) I couldn't even breathe. It just went away. I met, like it went away because cats needed to be part of my life. I believe that. Absolutely. Pam gets Cooper and Gouda. She brings them up here a lot. This is, you know, 12, 14 years ago, whatever it may be. And I'm, I'm, I'm worried. I'm like, well, can I watch these cats? No issue whatsoever. The 30-year allergy just went away, and it was a horrible allergy. Then I decided to venture and get my own bell. No problem. Then long hairs like puss and boots. No issue at all. Allergy just went away because I needed the cats in my life. No question about it, in my opinion. Needed it. They helped me. I'm not, I didn't help them. They're here for us, our pets. No doubt about it, in my opinion. Here's a repeating theme in entities like us on a certain journey, almost without fail, as, quote, old souls, whatever you want to call us, as they get ready to graduate, they become incredibly caring and emotional individuals. I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about. The trolls who monitor this channel for what they're going to talk about next are scratching their heads, confused as hell. They're not the same entity as we are. If I now appear to be like an alien to my old self then I know I'm succeeding. People like us ready to graduate out of here often become ridiculously sentimental. We have to make sure this sentimentality does not evolve into attachment. I think this emotion pours over us because as, quote, graduates, it really will be the last time we see or experience certain things on material planes. Who knows how many times we or our higher selves managing the incarnations have done certain things in the past. Quote, in the past, I kind of have to put it like that. As we've talked about, it could be, as Tony says, occurring simultaneously, the incarnations. But if we know we've done enough and it's finally time to exit these material planes, even the most routine of things could breed nostalgia if we are at this point of, quote, graduation. People don't like that term either. It's difficult to talk about. As long as you know what I mean, the word is adequate. Your particular incarnation listening to me now, you and I feel like we're 150 years removed from something like the Civil War in the United States. That's in the past when it may not be. It may be all stacked on top of each other. Time is simply the perception of where the record needle of consciousness or the consciousness of a certain incarnation is dropped. Maybe. In this case, it's many incarnations, but maybe not back to back if what Tony says is correct, happening simultaneous, which is a different, a very different than the traditional view of reincarnation. Either way, it's likely, in my opinion, we are a portion or a part of something greater. Every night you experience you as a dream character. That is certainly not all of you. There is much more to it. It's probably not much different as you go up the levels. To me, a one-and-done life where we basically only have 30 years to figure out anything worthwhile doesn't make any sense to me. The Christian's notion of all of eternity comes down to what we do, say, between the ages of 25 and 70 on earth, as you can imagine, is something I never accepted. So your entire afterlife, trillions of years, all of eternity weighs on the close watch of about 40 earth years. That's like one millionth of a second compared to all that there is. Regarding the overwhelming sentimentality that I mentioned a minute back and something I feel every day now, I've often struggled with what I thought were two opposing ideas. On one hand, I speak about the stuffed Lenin of the phrase, quote, don't look back. And I talk about cutting all Jacob Marley chains that we forged in life. 
I speak often of the C.S. Lewis great divorcing this reality and being done with these material planes of existence. On the other hand, I find myself absurdly nostalgic and sentimental to the tiniest of things around me. Not quite to this degree, but an example I've used before to make a point. Oh, oh, look, Here, here's a piece of cardboard that I know my cat Belle laid on this cardboard when she was alive, so I must keep this piece of cardboard forever. No, I must frame it. Well, I'm not quite that bad, but you get the idea. I wonder, why do I have such massive nostalgia and sentimentality at this moment in my life if I'm intent on separating from reality as one of my main goals in life? It's only confusing because my terminology has been stated incorrectly in the past. Quote, reality is too general of a way to put it. I'm dismantling the not nilks trick, and my main goal, at least at this time, is to cut ties with every aspect of the trickster. I'm not trying to great divorce from reality itself, per se. There's a difference between things like the natural world and the asshole dark. They're not the same thing. The not milk lays over the natural world the way a fart lingers in an elevator. In our discussions, we often say the reality is doing this or that, but that is stated incorrectly and is too vague. Remember the component parts of reality we discussed a few chapters back. The game board or natural world here is not the same as the asshole dark or the not milk. They're separate components. I now believe that this phase of nostalgia and sentimentality is a normal process of my spiritual evolution and a symptom of, for lack of better words, the graduation coming. That term, quote, graduation, also triggers a portion of our community. But the words of the spellcraft language weren't laid down in advance for us to have the discussions that we're having now. What the heck does it matter anyway, what I call it? The idea is the same. Unless you plan on staying here forever, at some point, you will graduate. Call it what you want. I think the constant expressions of sentimentality and nostalgia, that sort of emotion that flows out of us, and I'm, I'm assuming many of us are having the same experience that I am. If I'm wrong, let me know. But this comes with the realization of we are, in fact, leaving. I hear what you're saying, though. That nostalgia and sentimentality towards certain things in this world seems like a form of attachment or even an attempt to create attachment. It appears to be a violation of don't look back. This battle of opposing ideas between being sentimental over, say, the natural world and dropping Jacob Marley chains of the not nilk no longer bothers me. The not nilk is artificial. What happens naturally inside me is always correct if I can tap into the same frequency and get in touch with my inner tuning fork. Therefore, me being nostalgic about many things in life can be balanced with me continuing to cut ties with the dark parts of this reality. Let me be clear. I have no nostalgia or sentimentality over anything related to the not milk, like walking past an Xbox in a store and speaking to it. Xbox? I'll miss you and your satanic video games when I'm done in this snow globe, you cute little Saturn's cube. I'm not doing that to not milk things. However, I do in fact participate in that sort of activity with many things of the natural world, like the flower pot that I've talked about that I take care of each year. Take Always take care of one thing. If you're in an apartment in New York City, put one little flower pot on your balcony or whatever. Always take care of something is my advice. Um, I do that with the natural world, and it's almost like, why am I doing this? Like, I feel like maybe I'm not going to see it again. So the flower pot typically lasts until about November 1st in PA, where it gets very cold. I say goodbye, my goodbyes to it in early October. If anybody were to watch me doing it, they would have me hauled away and put into a white coat, thanking it for its beauty that it provided me all summer and getting choked up in doing it, as I've mentioned before. A lower being like a troll of this channel would mock this as some sort of weakness, but it's just the opposite. This is our greatest strength and the reason we came into this place called Earth. It is part two, the work. And there are a thousand other things we have to do to complete the work. We cannot complete part two, the work, if we're investigating mud flood.
I don't care what your belief set is, who you go before when you die, you go before your higher self or your Christian God or your Vishnu or your Shiva or Mohammed or whatever's waiting for you, for any of us up there. I guarantee you, not one of them, none of them is going to say, oh, what did you bring to the table during your incarnation? Well, I was able to expose this thing called mud flood and I was able to look at all the old pictures and tell people about a catastrophe, which freaked everybody out thinking that another one's coming. That's what you brought to the table in your incarnation? That ain't shit, son. Get down there and do it again. Lucky I don't send your aspect of us into the abyss. I think it may be that we're here to divorce ourselves from the not milk in every aspect of the trick, not necessarily from the natural world. I think that can be appreciated right up until the end without attachment. That we're allowed to say goodbye on our own terms to that thing. Not to the not no, completely different. That will weave its tentacles back around you very quickly, in my opinion. Most of my sentimentality is derived from how I will miss the natural world and related things like my cats when I'm finally done here. My nostalgia only extends into a few things, though, that some people could call the screen or the not milk. And I must be very honest, I can't pretend that this sort of nostalgia attachment doesn't exist, so I must examine why this is. Can't pretend that it's not there. A small handful of things I will miss that everybody would say come from the screen, like the first three Star Wars movies. Some old music, for example, some other stuff. If you and I, though, have come this far, I don't think it's possible at this point to show real nostalgia or sentimentality towards something that is truly evil or something that is completely of not milk and it's, or that's out to really screw us and damage us, even though we must say that the first three Star Wars movies is of the screen. I hear you. I think our perception is such that if it was evil and out to bring us down, we would see through it at this point. We would see through the trick. I must admit that the 1977 Star Wars is, by definition, every definition, we'd have to put forth the screen or the asshole dark. But I believe those movies must be mostly good for me to want to hold on to them in some way. I don't want to take them into my death, stuff DVDs into my coffin. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying at this point, I'm not, I'm not going to outright reject it. I enjoy watching it. I'm not going to say, oh, not milk. No, no. That's, there's, there are some exceptions, and I do struggle with why these exceptions exist. Maybe they must be mostly good for me to want to hold on to them in a way, as many of us do. Perhaps that's the reason Disney took it all over and is destroying the entire Star Wars franchise. For sometimes, destroying everything is the only way to destroy a single part. They must, uh, say, burn all crops to make sure they get what to them is the diseased corn. The great message from the first three, maybe. What if the first three Star Wars are, for lack of a correct word, good? I just watched Dances with Wolves recently again. As I've said many times, I've yet to find anything in that movie that is not good and genuine. I know many in our community believe that Hollywood is not capable of such purity, but I think there are a few exceptions. Because there has to be, maybe, especially in many of the movies of the past. The Wizard of Oz tells a real person more about their particular predicament in this place than anything ever placed on film. Many movies, like The Matrix, carry both truth and deception at the same time. And one has to be advanced enough to separate the truth from the lies. If I'm sentimental toward the natural world, I don't think that's a Jacob Marley chain that can tie me here or act to convince my higher self to not be done with this entire place. What is being discussed here is proven in how we love our animals. I bet the following doesn't resonate with your inner tuning fork. Uh, I must no longer love Addy or Zara or Gouda because they could be ties to this world. No, we're not going to do that. You know, I don't have children, so insert your children's names in that example. We know it's okay to love in this way or to be sentimental or nostalgic in this way. We know it's pure if, what's the missing component? There is no trick involved. There is no not nil trick between me and my love for Zara. There is no not nil trick between me and me caring for that flower pot that I'm saying goodbye to. The not nil trick is not an element in the equation. Therefore, it's genuine, and there's no problem, in my opinion, with that sort of what some people could call attachment. 
it becomes a greater sense of nostalgia and sentimentality because exiting these material planes for good makes it we really are coming to the realization that this is the last time we will do or see these sorts of things which makes it sentimentality and nostalgia on steroids. It's a natural process of leaving something behind for good, the way you might have looked back at your high school one last time before going off to graduation. The not no trick is not an element in the equation. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. As far as we've come, as far as we've progressed, there's nothing, of course, that can keep us here if we decide we're truly ready to leave it all behind for good. In the example, you have a certain different belief set maybe than I have, but in my example, that the aspect of me that's not here, or what Tony talks about, the higher self managing simultaneous incarnations, you've heard me kind of in a mocking way talk to it, say, get us out of here. And just if we are truly ready to get us out of here, of course the not milk is powerless, or anything would be powerless if it's truly up to us. Why? Here we go again. Because we said so. Because a little slimy thing that plays a trick has no power other than what it wields through its trick. It's all up to us, or it wouldn't operate behind a trick. First grade stuff. But based on this very important conversation we're having now, we have to, over the next few weeks, re-examine at least our personal understanding of the phrase, don't look back, which to me is an obvious stuffed Lenin, or you could call it a Humpty Dumpty. Don't look back, artificially carried through time, I see now that it's even uh, a Korean TV series of a few years ago. It just keeps coming over and over again. The biblical reference of Lot's wife looked back. It's the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah turned to salt. Uh, what is it? Orpheus and Eurydice or whatever, Hades, another god. Both gods said don't look back. And the first two examples of don't look back we have in recorded history, in this case, Hades in the underworld said to Orpheus, don't look back. And he's all excited to see his love Eurydice come out of the damn underworld. He looks back too soon, the dumb son of a beach, and she disappears. So he suffers. So don't look back. And it's in TV shows. It's all over the place. So, okay, we better be real clear if this is something that artificially is carried through time by reality itself, and it is a stuffed Lenin or a Humpty Dumpty, don't look back. We got to be real sure what it means to us. I mean, is it, oh, Matt, you're going through the sentimentality now, and you're you're really uh, nostalgic, but, but as you approach the moment of death, you better give that nostalgia up. Maybe that's what it means. I don't think we're going to be sure at this time. It is a stuffed Lenin. It is carried through time artificially. There's incredible importance in our own personal interpretation or understanding of what that means. Don't look back in terms of attachments to this world, what you consider to be an attachment or not. And over the, you know, as usual, work it, we'll work it out over the next few weeks. I mean, I don't, you know, is, is there anybody that literally believes that God, the Christian God turned Lot's wife to salt? I mean, it's, it's, it's teaching a lesson. I don't think it's literal, but that's just me. We know that people like you and I, the real people here, are integral parts of how this reality works in ways we'll never understand while we're alive in the body. We're needed to generate the world around us in some way. The Big Bang didn't come first. Consciousness came first. Per the Kabbalion and other ancient teachings, this has been known for thousands of years. The creeps know this too. This is why we, real people, are the S-O-L-E or S-O-U-L, sole focus of its trick. It's almost a certainty that what I call not milk needs us in many ways, perhaps even to survive. At the very least, it can't construct the house of Dracula that it wants to build on its own. It needs us to move the bricks around. We humans are reality input-output devices. In this way, Reality, and even the outer ring or screen, is a reflection of ourselves in some way. There's a lot of, quote, new evidence that supports this strange conclusion, even through accepted scientific theory, what they spout off at Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, and Oxford. For example, the double slit experiment shows that consciousness influences matter. The double slit eraser experiment essentially proves retrocausality and that the past can be affected by the present or the past affected by future events. Most scientists accept the double slit experiment, and in doing that, agree that consciousness is a building block for all things. But to be expected, these scientists do not abandon their Carl Sagan concepts of what the greater universe is for some reason. 
They believe in something like the double slit experiment, and then they still think human beings will someday fly around in space like Captain Kirk. The belief in both at the same time are not compatible, scientists. They can't exist at the same time. For some reason, these Cambridge eggheads can't understand this. Hey, jerks! You can't believe that consciousness observation turns light waves into particles, and then at the same damn time, you believe nebulas form stars in deep space on their own, billions of miles away from consciousness. They're forming the stars, and nobody on Earth is even thinking about it. These notions are not compatible, you Nobel Prize wannabes. Well, what do you expect from a group of people who believe that you and I were once marmots, rubbing our crusty asses on thorn bushes? The not nilk and many of the top minions know more than we do about how this particular reality works. They have their reality buttons and levers. For their trick to work so well on the masses, they would have to almost understand the inner workings of the engine. Their incarnation does not appear to be Tommy, like ours is. They're not the deaf, dumb, and blind kid at birth. Over time, they've refined their trick to move the collective conscious to a frequency that is better able to build their Dracula's castle. They know what levers to pull to get real people to create the reality that they want. They float out blurry images and vague notions regarding what they want society to become. Then they execute a trick so real people cement these blurry concepts, bringing them into vivid reality permanently. They need us to create the clarity and harden the cement. They can't do it themselves, it appears. We're the water in the cement mixture. Without us, their ingredients are just powder, and their reality does not harden. Their blurry images only get clear when we, real people, believe in them, or at least accept them without question. Usually they start small and incrementally, like putting Bruce's Yam's gender on 200 magazine covers. Then as we saw, it grows out from there, no pun intended, and becomes a permanent part of reality. In just about 10 years, the Transformers, more than meets the eye, that, that's a cartoon bot, the Transformers, that issue went from almost nothing in 10 years to millions of families in the Western world having a child who is unsure of what they are. In the old days, you just had to go to the bathroom. This simply can't happen in a real world, this encroachment in such a short period of time. This can only occur in a realm where the creeps have very powerful reality buttons and levers in a place powered by the consciousness of real people. It might lend new meaning to that stupid phrase we see all over the place, powered by, you know, they're powered by AWS, or it's usually a website or technology, powered by this operating system, whatever. You know, a bunch of horseshit. We see it too much. It's like, is that a stuff, Lenin? Or Humpty, Humpty Dumpty, in a way. All this is powered by, it's like the, the hint, what would be the hint? The hint is the entire reality is powered by the creative imagination of real people who have fallen for a damn trick and a spell. Or, Matt, then how come we can't break through? I don't know. Maybe our, maybe we need a bigger sample size. I mean, we could do group meditation all we want, but what are we? The 1%, the 1%, the 1%, the 1%. We're a tiny little group. You know, and, it's, it's, and it's, that's why it's putting us out to pasture. Because maybe whatever we believe is nullified by all the real people around us that think we're freaking nuts. But we are breaking through in a way from our own perspective. That's why off the ship of fools, we look back, it all just looks insane. We are breaking through for ourselves. And in a way about yourself journey, that's all that matters. Let it break down for us. If Tony thinks it's completely legitimate and believable, well, so what? It's on him. I'd rather have it break down to an absolute bozo show on steroids times a million than have things look legitimate. Do you see how that's a positive for us? The faker the world becomes, the more real you become. Obviously, not literally, and we don't then need the world breaking down for us to, we just realize who we are. There's no doubt that this world or this realm is a reflection of our particular brand of incarnation. It's not like we're in a little rowboat, but most real people, right, are still on the ship. As we look around the world today, it's becoming a strange and hellish place. This means that the collective consciousness of real people, at least at this moment in time, is pretty messed up. What can our little group in the rowboat that's off the ship do about it? Can a plugged-in fan on the beach push back the high tide of the Atlantic Ocean coming in? This tide is a society that is being crafted and created by a potentially a billion real people who all believe in the same delusion. One need only to watch the news or look online to gauge the state of the collective consciousness. It's an egotistical world of selfies and TikTok insanity. 
Again, the whole gender and non-binary, the pronoun issue, it's a cake and a lake reality giveaway. There's no way all that could have come so quickly. I recently got an email from somebody at a big company, and in the footer of the email, in addition to it listing their name and their phone number and address and all the information, in the email, it referenced their pronoun preferences. Okay, this is nothing new. We've all heard this, but it's another thing to see it for the first time for real. Right under the phone number, it said preferred pronouns. It said she dash her. I said to myself, ah, very risky of you to use the traditional ones, especially when so many in the company probably want to be they them. In evil genius fashion, the not milk has refined a vicious loop of demented reality creation. First, the screen floats a blurry image of what the not milk wants. Then the minions are used as influencers to direct the behavior of the masses and to be trendsetters like Bruce's yams gender. Finally, real people add to the key ingredients it needs for the cement to harden. So getting back to the Carl Sagan types, if reality is generated by the collective consciousness of real people, then it's important to point out that that's the exact opposite of the Big Bang. If an explosion came from space, then consciousness created it, not the other way around. The endless amount of space TV shows and movies, and ridiculous presentations on the news like Blue Origin water heater rides, it's all there to get real people to believe in the description of space that they've created, which started way back around the time of H.G. Wells and Flash Gordon. If enough real people believe that space is something that the Millennium Falcon can fly around in, then because consciousness drives reality, perhaps the movie concept of outer space actually can start to take shape over time. Could they be building it out using real people as the imaginative engine? Why would they do it, you ask? Well, maybe it's like Jared Kushner's only potential form of escape. The Apollo missions may be aptly named after the sun god. Perhaps they did send rockets up to get close to this local thing that burns and provides heat. And just 10 minutes into the first Apollo mission, Alan Shepard said on the radio, uh, guys, uh, bad news, uh, nobody's going nowhere. <laughs> I'm close to this thing called the sun. It ain't even hot up here. It's freaking cold. It, this thing ain't what we thought, and we ain't going nowhere. Let's move to plan B, where we get these poor devils to believe in Buck Rogers for a few centuries. That may allow us to get out. All the truthers at the back of the Amish classroom, and even through all the middle rows, of course, they believed uh, Neil and buzzed it was cake in a lake, right? That, but it probably wasn't cake in a lake in terms of what they presented us. It was, but it, they oh, the rockets just blasted off and splashed down. No, they're called the Apollo missions. That's the sun god. They probably went up to study the sun. I mean, they, 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 they're going to, all that for nothing? No, they probably get something out of it. Send, even if they were manned or not. The Apollo missions, the sun gods, send the damn rockets up close to a local sun, and they will try to understand it. And then they'll put in a textbook the Carl Sagan version, which is complete bullshit. Summarizing this section, and to be clear, if anybody's relatively new, we don't know what is out there in what they call space. Of course, no tinfoil never did no Mars flyby. Didn't you see Capricorn 1? Old Neil and Buzzed, Buzz was, was having a six-pack of Pabst during his mission in a little room. Didn't you see Capricorn 1? It's an O.J. Simpson truth drop. Matt Damon ain't up there doing who knows what to his potatoes. It's highly unlikely that Mars is anything like what the movies or Carl Sagan makes it out to be. It could be a light associated with a form of energy or plasma, whatever that is. If you want to sound smart in the truth community, just yell out plasma in your sleep from time to time. It's absurd that they tell us how some planets are dirt and rock and others are gas giants. Well, how did Jupiter get all the gas and we and Mars got all the rock? That's as unfair as the UAE getting all the gas. Look, Jupiter may be nothing more than a form of energy that drives their creepy astrology. I'm well aware that the average person can take even just a $1,000 telescope, set it up out back, and you can see Jupiter. You can see Saturn's rings and these little speckles around Jupiter. Well, that's the moon Io or whatever, all the little moons. So the little speckly light things, they're gigantic moons of rock. Well, how do you know? How do you know? 
I know you can see something that doesn't look like a star in your $1,000 Cracker Jack telescope. Well, how do you know what it is? And the bigger point is a real person shouldn't care what it is. Whether it's a gas giant or a float that they let loose from the Macy's Day Parade, the one that little Natalie Wood was participating in and it floated up and made Jupiter. I don't give a shit. Real people don't need planets. It's interesting to look at astrology from time to time. Astrology does, in a way, influence this reality. But it doesn't. You're not beholden to it as a real person. In terms of what I need to do for myself, I don't give a shit what the planets are t- telling me tomorrow. Sure, it inf- there's no doubt that it's not bullshit. Astrology influences the re- this reality. But there's a difference between a real person like you and me and the creeps who have to look to the planets for everything. We talked about it recently. George Washington laid down the first stone so La Fontan, whatever his name, could come in and build Washington, D.C. And Virgo had to be here with Jupiter. It's like, why, did it, why does that creepy entity have to do everything by the stars? It influences this reality. But in terms of my way about, my way about myself journey, I don't give a flying blank where the planets are tomorrow and what I think I need to do for myself. But since we're discussing space, we need to wrap it up with this, of course. The first great truther will call out, "Um, well, Matt, this doesn't make any sense. I I can't reconcile this. So the 5,000 workers at JPL Labs in Pasadena are somehow all fooled into thinking they have a few different Chef Emerald air fryers crawling around Mars? I don't get that. How could that possibly be pulled off? Then if it's not that and they're all fooled, there's only one other explanation. They're all in on it because to the first grade truther, you have to go into that same toy box for the answer. This toy box has to have the right toy answer. You have to be inside your reality bookends. You can't allow for anything else. So yeah, we're skeptical. We don't think they're really Chef Emerald air fryers crawling around trying to help Matt Damon on Mars. So they're either all fooled, all 10,000 employees, or, uh uh-oh, they all took the Jack Parsons Voldemort unbreakable oath, and they all know exactly what's going on, every one of them. And then, but Matt, you can bridge both through things like compartmentalization. I never heard that before in the truth community. Tell me about, oh, you can bridge being fooled with being in on it with compartmentalization compartmentalization. Oh, you know, Matt, the person that makes the gloves doesn't know that those gloves aren't going up to Matt Damon. You know, I never heard that before. No, both sides of the coin are impossible. They all took the unbreakable oath or they're all fooled. You can't reconcile it. That's what the graduate level truther comes to this uh, epiphany, whatever that is. The graduate level truther finally learns a few lessons, goes back 100,000 feet and looks down at it from a distance and says, what is its repeating themes? What is it out to do to us every single time? Clarice, read the Marcus Aurelius of the thing. What does it do, this man you seek? What does this not milk do that we seek to understand? Well, it creates two sides of a coin as usual. It's one or the other. JPL Labs, when all that stuff in rovers going to Mars, they're Almost all would have to be fooled, like five people in the know, or thousands and thousands have to be in on it. It it has to be one side of the coin or the other. Oh, 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 there we go with that duality stuff again, how reality operates. So we have with the catastrophe thespians and the weird mall and school events, we have it's it's the um, Burl Ives again, silver and gold. We have the paid and threatened, and then a reality itself. We have it's hijacked and trapped, hijacked and tra- it's always like two sides, right? Well, uh oh, that's a symptom of how reality operates. I'm going to say it's part of a gigantic game that's being played here, and I'm not going to put any time researching it. I'm going to say and call it a cop out. LL Cool J would call it a comeback that it can't be figured out. There's no possible way to reconcile that that there there's so many people that believe there's little emerald deep air fryers crawling around Mars when they're we know they're not there. But this is the greatest evidence in the world to people like my friend Tony, who would present a very strong and hard to break through argument, saying, Matt, you yourselves and your crazies realize that you can't have all of JPL labs fooled. 
There's like five people that understand and thousands of workers and all compartmental. You understand how impossible that would be. And forget JPL. It's one exa- Go back to the entire NASA program, back to the, the early 60s. I mean, that's you. it's all pulled off with nobody in the know, but tiny little groups of people. You see, and then Tony would say, well, they can't all be in on it. That's ridiculous, too. And it, that is a strong argument. One or Neither one of them make any sense. Therefore, to someone like my friend Tony would say, well, there's only one possible explanation, Matt, that everything CNN is telling you is real and every single mission actually happened. There's, see, there's, you can't reconcile any of it in a fake world. So we have to be done trying. All we can do is apply the end of war games philosophy. You know what that is. You know what's coming. Okay, um, you can make it into a verb. I'm end of war gaming, this son of a bitch which the first great truth is call a cop-out. Matt, you're just not willing to put the time and effort into research anymore. Go do what you want. I see that's exactly what it wants from me. That's the underlying design of the game in this reality system to suck you back into the bog. I know for a fact that researching both sides to see which one is right when neither are right or all are right at the same time. What is the earth? Which shape is it? It's none of it and all of it at the same time. I see its tactics in pulling me back into the bog. What I'm calling the biggest revelation for the graduate-level truther of all of reality, the war game's quote of the only winning move is not to play, and that it can't be won that tic-tac-toe match against the Whopper computer, or figuring out are they all fooled, Matt, or are they all in on it? It can't be won in this reality system. Matt, all of NASA are 90 or percent more hundreds of thousands of workers completely fooled and compartmentalized or is it 90 percent are all in on it well here's what it is a uh, play against the computer the tic-tac-toe game at the end of war games a uh, put set player zero so it plays itself there's no winner it is the tic-tac-toe game trying to figure out this reality it is far less real than what it seems it's that simple it's not a cop-out first grade truthers It's the ultimate revelation, a realization for a graduate level that's ready to leave behind these reality systems. You want to talk about Jacob Marley Chains and sucking you back in. If you have one foot in the bog and you are not completely out, there's your don't look back. You are in any way in the bog, then reality somehow has its tentacles around you. And that doesn't necessarily mean hijacked and trapped. Maybe it means the higher self was looking at your particular incarnation, the only one that's not a complete screw-off, said, oh, this one has a chance to break free or help us break out, or we can really learn something from this one. It's, it's, oh, no, they're going back into the bog. He thinks it can be figured out. The shape of the, well, that and a million other things it throws at you to tempt you to figure out, is everybody uh, in on it at JPL, or are they all fooled? Oh, what's the perfect mix? And Oh man, I thought I thought this particular incarnation was the only non-screw up we had and there he goes back into the mud bath bog that damn incarnation son of a beach. Regarding what we're talking about here, the not milk is so evil genius. It wins in how most of our own truth research community forms its opinions. It still wins in how they take it up unless you can absolutely leave it all behind. For example, much of our, quote, community, does not believe, of course, in these missions. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, of course our group doesn't. However, here's the key. If they still believe in the general description of space itself, it is something that potentially Buck Rogers can fly around, and it's just that the U.S. never, a quote, pause, went. That's all the not Nil cares about protecting. I think we covered this in the last chapter a bit, so I'll be brief. So in this way, even most people in our community, they fuel this wing of its Dracula castle construction. At this level, at least, there's only one underlying truth it wants to protect, that space is not what anybody believes it to be and not what Carl Sagan says. So it's thrilled with if there's 100 million people that don't believe that anything happened with Neil and Buzzed. It's doesn't care one bit, in my opinion, if somebody takes up that side of the two-headed, the two-sided coin, or, or digs in in that camp, because or if they still believe in the notion of what space is. 
This happens, this is very similar to the graduated animal farm approach it employs all the time. Look at the 7-Eleven job application or the big event in 2001. Okay, it says this is what it gives the first grade truth or that C starts to th see through it. Then what's the next grade up? The a certain uh, incendiary, incendiary, um, which remember Dr. Stephen Jones or whatever, pause, nano, uh, sounds like a hermit, <laughs> nano hermit, <laughs> nano strom thermite and, you know, whatever. Okay, it, the nano, you know what? Okay, that that's just another animal farm inside that event. And Matt, if somebody's screaming at me, I can hear you right now. Then Dr. Judy's uh, Hurricane Aaron, um, you know, free energy devices and all, that could be another layer. Yes, it can be. And you generally get you start to see through this stuff when you see that wargaming it or ver putting that into a verb, wargaming this whole reality, son of a bitch, and putting it so it plays itself and there is no winning move and there is no figuring anything out. It's probably the only way to not look back and leave for good because we simply can't accept. Took Look at the 7-Eleven job application, the big event. Well, something must have happened in a certain exact way, Matt, and somebody knows exactly how it went down. No, it does not mean it it had to happen in a certain way, and somebody knows exactly as it went down. We can't see around more than one corner in this body with limited senses and perception. We have to be open to things that seem impossible or inconceivable to us. That there is nobody that actually can point to exactly how 7-Eleven went down. So there, if that's the case, as much as I would say if I had to place my chips on one number, Judy would be where I put it. But I'm starting to see general trends across the reality, how it does business, where the only winning move is not to play and these things can't be figured out. And you see the similarities if you start to open your mind up to these possibilities, how the cathedrals were constructed. It can't be figured out. And that way, just saying part of reality itself is closer to the truth than anything else. The megalithic sites, uh, how this was pulled off. There is there's no possible way a reality could pull all 10,000 things that we looked at off. It's I don't know if this is appropriate, but it leads me back to the um, the kingdom of heaven. Who has claim on Jerusalem? All have claim. Who has claim? None have claim. So all have claim at the same time. None have claim at the same time. To me, what's the shape of what we're walking on? Well, it's splat turf. No, it's round. No, it's all, depending on what you expect. And it's none. No real world could do this. Therefore, there is no exact, somebody must know exactly what went down in 2001. No, not necessarily. At some point, when you start to see through this, then you can eventually leave the bog for good. That's why Tartaria research, so complete waste of time falling for the reality trick. In summary, we are very close to winning when we can see that the debate of one side of an argument or another, the debate and trying to find out which side of the coin is correct, is the trick itself. And there is no correct answer on either side of the coin. It is a coin that only appears to have two sides to us. And one side has to be right because we're in a body that is very limited, very low, with limited senses and perception. Therefore, the only winning move is not to play. In this case, try to figure it out. Now, it is hard to kind of get to this level, assuming anybody believes that I'm correct, but it can be done incrementally by just seeing how the reality plays its game and how the not nilk understands what reality buttons and levers to push. Let's just look at the shape of what we're walking on. Okay, what did they say? Back in the day, a thousand years ago, uh, everybody believed uh, that it was flat, right? They said a thousand years ago. So then they brought forth um, the, the truth community, which is the deception of uh, uh, Copernicus and Galileo and Ptolemy or Ptolemy or whatever, all that stuff, okay? And then they wanted, Matt, they wanted to change the perception. And then potentially, it is interesting to, to walk through this type of example, as they changed 
the perception and the real creative beings that drive the reality. Remember, reality came first before real things and the Big Bang. And I don't know why certain truthers are triggered by the double slit experiment, because it basically is just saying uh, in a scientific sense what we all believed. Oh, it's of science, so we can't look at that. It's just saying what we all believe. Consciousness came first. Why would anybody in the truth committee be triggered by the double slit experiment? So if you can use your math and your Newton and your Fig Newton and your Copernicus and your Ptolemy and your Galileo to get billions of real creative generative beings to believe that it's a certain shape, then potentially it starts to take that shape by measurement, math, or whatever perception. But then because, remember, thousands of or millions of real people a thousand years ago believed it was it was splat turf, those residuals may exist, the residuals that show that may exist for that reason, or because the what we're walking on has no definitive shape because that's what people believed in, those that investigate that, uh, that sort of thing find those residuals and that evidence kind of comes back to life because it existed a thousand years ago, if you see what I'm saying. It's it, it, it's not coming out very well. I'm not going to re-record this, but it's just a physical example, potentially, of how um, the perception of the masses drive what actually is experienced physically. You know that I believe we live in a fluid reality, which I believe works like one big Mandela effect. Reality is reset all the time, in my opinion, and you and I go along with whatever these changes are, maybe even daily. This may be thousands of times a day. Who knows? When it resets, we go along with it. We're not the only ones immune. Just like for a certain Mandela effect, we can see our friends just reset to it like they're on a download. Or we're on a download as well because we are in this reality system. And there's every once in a while, there's a little glitch we call the Mandela effect. Most things we reset to, in my opinion, just like everyone else. This means from our perception, if there is a change in a fluid reality, from our perception, nothing has changed. It's the old example is yesterday the sky was red. You've heard me talk about that. According to history and record, nothing has changed because it goes back through time. How reality works this way? Matt, who would set a reality up to work this way? It seems awfully complicated. I hear you. I don't think we have all the answers, and we weren't really there in the room when the reality was set up. It's probably a little bit outside of our limited monkey brain to understand, so just let it go. This is the way it works, in my opinion. To us, it seems that what is actually new has always been here, or things have always been this way if something resets or changes in a fluid reality. Strangely, reality reflects that it's always been this way after what we call a change. Change isn't even the right word, because it's not a change, because it works back through time in retrocausal fashion. Therefore, after a, quote, change, there is no date of change. Therefore, after a, quote, change, there never was a change. Okay, yeah, it's, it's slightly confusing. <laughs> what had existed never existed. So how can you say it had existed? I know it's hard to wrap our head around. It does get easier if you just think about this tour shit over and over like I do. It's not as really as complicated as it seems. There's no other way to explain it other than a change happens in a fluid reality, and what is new ripples back through time, meaning it has always been and always was there, and there never was a change in the first place. If one sees a change and calls it a Mandela effect, then per their research, they find there was no date of change to reference, means that there was nothing that changed in the first place, yet for some reason, those that have a Mandela effect experience believe very clearly or, or remember the change before it happened. Research will show, as they do their their research on things they call a Mandela effect, that it's always been that way, other than the residuals that somehow strangely pop up, and the residuals do make this sort of research awfully complicated. The change ripples back through time where it has always been. The notion is actually supported by science via their double-slit eraser experiment. I think that seemingly insignificant Mandela effect changes like Kit Kat dashes, things like that, and other little things that people notice, movie lines, or I think those are symptoms of a much bigger phenomenon related to greater changes in reality itself, and things that may be quite natural that were intended in this reality, things that we don't notice. Um, in other words, if a Kit Kat dash change is what you call a Mandela effect, 
you, in seeing that Mandela effect, likely seeing a symptom of something greater related to reality itself. So are the creeps responsible in some way? And is the Mandela effect a byproduct of them taking too big of a bite, a B-I-T-E, B-Y-T-E, into the reality in some way using their buttons and levers? Yeah, maybe. It's possible that what the, you call the Mandela effect in a normally fluid reality is a symptom of something the creeps are trying to do at CERN or anywhere else. Who knows? You know, whatever. To me, reality has always generally worked this way of being fluid and resetting. Again, we'll never understand why it doesn't seem like the greatest way to build a reality, but it just seems like this is very natural to me. Okay, we'll never know in the body why it was set up this way. Now, the creeps understand more about it than I do, of course, and have perhaps meddled with their buttons and levers, meddled with their witch's brew, and they create in some way in what they try to achieve for themselves glitches like the Mandela effect. It doesn't matter at the end of the day, okay? I know it's, it's complicated. There's the best news. It doesn't matter to real people like you and me. If through meddling, they destroyed this world tomorrow, just, you know, really, really did too, went too far, I don't think it would make a bit of difference to real people and our timeless selves. Be like, okay, that, it's like waking up from a dream. Let them do whatever they're going to do. Who cares? Your core essence would not be harmed or affected if they did something really drastic to this world. I'm not just saying that to make myself feel better. I mean, real people are convinced of this at this point. I mean, they maybe are trapped here. We're not. Only a small part of us, in my opinion, is in here. How much of them is in here? From the Crete's perspective, is the entirety of them in this reality system or snow globe? That's the case. Um, you know, Tony talks about sequential incarnations, and you, it doesn't mean one and done. Maybe you come back in another Barbara Bush body or whatever, but you better be a little careful. I'm not one to give out advice on how to manage a reality system, but in terms of creepy buttons and levers, you better be, if you have a lot of yourself in here or your entire essence is here, you've got to be kind of careful. I mean, what, you know, what the heck? I'm not very worried about it. To us, I think to real people listening, this would be like waking up from a dream. It's another train stop. You say, oh, that's what that was? Oh, let's move on to something else. And you forget all about it. 50 years later, whatever the equivalent would be in the spiritual world, you'd be like, oh, shit. Remember you remember a dream, like you start cutting tomatoes or something, and you totally forget about the dream. There were all these tomatoes in your dream, but you don't remember until you start cutting tomatoes for real. We could be like 50 years from now, be like, oh, shit. Hey, Billy Bob, you, were you on that place called Earth? Yeah, we were in that dream together. Oh, shit, I forgot all about it. Maybe it's that inconsequential. Hopefully not, but um, I don't think it's as big of a deal as we all make it out to be. Okay, guys, to wrap this up, um, I didn't show you the little you know statistics of subscriber numbers coming in. I'll show you in a video this week. I think it was like 85 subscribers this month on you know whatever the usual, like 6 million minutes to watch or whatever, but I'm not surprised. Think about what is being said here. This is not right for like 95% of the truth community. They don't want nothing to do with this message. It's amazing we have as many people as we do. It's only right for those really that are ready to leave the whole reality system behind, that it can't be figured out. Seeing the absolute nature of the same games it plays and the nature of the trick itself is what you need to see through, not figuring it out or what the next conspiracy will be or the mud flood to research. There's too many people addicted to too many topics. How many people have truly exited the bog? I mean, very, very few. And it not Nilk knows how to play this game, so most truthers never relieve the bog. Even Tony has expressed to me, you know, how difficult it is to leave this game that the incarnations need to help. The higher self has to have certain realizations or an understanding that certain things have been accomplished. Or I mean, I, he, I, don't, you know, I, I don't know if he understands all of it. I certainly don't understand all of what he tried to explain in this regard, but it all made sense when he did. It's not easy. I mean, this does get back one last time to the don't look back. We have to really determine what that means to us, the don't look back. Yeah, you know, we got a hint of it years ago, and we said, this not Nilk has put on us, or we've put on ourselves, what we call Jacob Marley Chains. I mean, this is the easy first step to drop the attachments that it has put on us using its pathetic little tricks, like the straw man of all caps, first name, all caps, last name. Yeah, sure, we saw in the first inning that we need to drop these Jacob Marley Chains, but what does don't look back mean to us? So the not-nilk is, is a role player here with its minions, in my opinion, as a role player. 
Not that it will decide with its Saturn moon matrix and we're powerless, oh, we're screwed and hijacked and trapped. Not that it, but it might understand its role to a degree. Know that its role is to play the spiritual adversary, to not give higher self an incarnation, not even one that allows it to get what it needs out of these reality systems, to constantly trip it up and to stop the progress. Not that it has any power. But it could say, oh, it might know what the higher self needs the incarnations to do, or just if you don't believe in multiple at the same time or simultaneous, what you need to do. And it knows it has no power, that the part of you that's not here potentially has the power or does have the power, and it will still impede your journey. So the higher self says, you know what? Look at this incarnation, little Matt down here. Did he give us what we needed? No. Did this, what about this incarnation over here? Did it give us what we needed? No. So in a way, the no consequences people were right in one part that they took exception to me when I said we can give spiritual pieces of ourselves away here. I think they were right saying we can't do that. However, like I've said many times over the past few months, if you just have a screw-off incarnation and you don't give the part of you that's not here what it really needs out of your incarnation, then by definition to the no consequences people, that's a consequence. Not that you're, you can't give yourself away to the Pope's abyss, but if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing in these reality systems and you're a screw-off and somebody that falls for every trick of the knot milk, of course, would not be doing what the higher self or the other spiritual part needs out of the incarnation, or why is the knot milk playing its trick? Why is it acting as the spiritual adversary to trip us up? to get us back in the bog. That's what it does to truthers. To the normie, it provides the red carpet and other sorts of distractions. So we add another sentence on what is the not milk here to do? It's to prevent the incarnation from giving its whole self or its higher self what it needs out of the incarnation. It could be that simple. Is the, if it can impede, then according to even I think even Tony would agree with this, the higher self keeps having to send simultaneous incarnations into similar systems so it can eventually get what it needs, hoping one of the little incarnations can overcome the not milk, most probably fail. Guess who the one that has a chance of overcoming it and giving higher self what it needs? Not Jack Burton, me, but me, you and me. So let's get it done this time, whatever that means to you. Thanks for listening.